Hey, how's it going? Welcome to How To Audio Recording. This time we're gonna be talking about how sound works and we're gonna split it up into two videos because there's a lot of ground to cover here and really each of these topics could be its own video all by itself. But we just kinda of wanna go over the basics here. So in this video, in part one, we're gonna be covering the physical characteristics of sound. So what is a sound wave and how do we describe a sound wave? We're gonna talk about frequency, wavelength, amplitude, envelope, and harmonic content. So let's talk about the physical characteristics of sound. What is sound and how does it work? Let's start by visualizing a wave. Let's look at the parts of a wave and how they're made. So pretend that this tub of muddy water is air in a room and this shovel is a speaker. The speaker's job is two parts. The first part of its job is movement forward. When the speaker moves forward, the air particles sitting directly in front of it get pushed into one another. They get compressed together. So this is called the compression phase and it forms a little peak. The second part of a speaker's job is movement backwards, and when it moves backwards, it pulls air with it, which forms this little trough directly in front of it. This is called the rarefaction phase. So as the speaker moves forward and backwards, it creates this series of compressions and rarefactions, or peaks and valleys, or however you want to think about it. And this goes for anything that creates sound, whether it's a speaker, a voice, a guitar, your neighbor using power tools next door, anything. This is essentially what sound waves look like. You have a peak and a valley. Now that we know how sound waves are made, let's take a look at some of the features we can use to help describe them. These are frequency, wavelength, amplitude, envelope, and harmonic content. When we talk about frequency, what we're really asking is how often does a wave occur? And that makes sense, right? Frequency, how frequently does it happen? So when we're looking at a wave, the easiest way to see how frequently it happens is to look at it from one peak to the next peak. So in our speaker example here, a peak represents the speaker being pushed all the way out. So one cycle for the speaker is from being pushed all the way out, pulling all the way in, and pushing all the way out again, from peak to peak. And we describe frequency in hertz. One hertz equals one cycle in one second. So then, for example, 500 hertz means there are 500 waves happening in one second. So let's watch a frequency of 2 hertz to see what it actually looks like, first in slow motion. So after a time period of 1 second, the speaker has generated 2 cycles, 2 hertz. So let's speed it up and look at it in real time now. All right, now we know what it looks like. Let's get to what's really important here. What does it sound like? Well, we can't actually hear two hertz. It's too low for us. The human range of hearing, theoretically, is 20 hertz up to 20,000 hertz. Below 20 hertz, it becomes more of a feeling than a hearing phenomenon, and above 20,000 hertz, that's the range of, you know, dog whistles. So, this is what the range of human hearing looks and sounds like. So basically what it comes down to is that we hear differences in frequency as differences in pitch. The higher the frequency, the higher the pitch. Wavelength and frequency are very closely related to one another. In fact, they're inversely related. So as one goes up, the other one goes down. Here's why. Sound moves outward at the same rate of speed no matter what the frequency is. So all sound moves at the speed of sound. No faster, no slower. Let's look at our speaker example again. On the top, we have a speaker working at 4 hertz. On the bottom, we have a speaker working at 2 hertz. Sound is moving away from both speakers at the speed of sound. So let's imagine that there's a wall moving away from the speakers at the speed of sound. If the speaker on top is working twice as fast as the speaker on bottom, but sound isn't getting away from it any faster, then that means that it's going to fill the same amount of space with twice as many waves. And in order to fill the same amount of space with twice as many waves, each wavelength is going to have to be shorter. Therefore, as the frequency goes up, that same amount of space is going to have to accommodate even more waves, so the wavelengths are going to have to get shorter and shorter. 
So just to put it in perspective, a frequency of 20 hertz is gonna have a wavelength of about 54.8 feet. That's massive, that's a lot of air to move for one wave. On the other end of the spectrum, a frequency of 20,000 hertz or 20 kilohertz is gonna have a wavelength of about two thirds of an inch. So that's a pretty wide range from two thirds of an inch for 20,000 hertz to 54.8 feet for 20 hertz. So if wavelength describes how long a wave is, amplitude talks about how tall a wave is. We perceive this as volume. Um, this is important to understand both for how sound works and then also later when we talk about distortion, amplitude will enter into it. Quick demonstration. I'm gonna play a couple of different instruments and I wanna see if you can guess what instrument I'm playing based on how one note sounds. Number one. Number two. Number three. And number four. Cheers. So I played the same note on four different instruments, and now we know that frequency determines pitch. So how come each of those instruments sound different even though I played the same pitch on all four of them? The answer is in envelope and harmonic content. Every sound, just like every story, has a beginning, a middle, and an end. And so we use envelope to describe each of those parts, both how loud it is and how long it lasts. And there are four terms that we use to characterize those. We use attack to describe the beginning of the sound, decay to describe the transition from the beginning to the middle, sustain to describe the middle of the sound, and release to describe the end of the sound. Let's take a look at a couple of different sound profiles and analyze their envelopes. First, a snare drum. Second, a cello. And lastly, a cymbal crash. Okay, so let's map out each of these envelopes, starting with the snare drum. The attack of the snare drum comes in fast and loud. It goes from no sound to loud sound right away. Then the decay kicks in and drops the sound level pretty dramatically, almost as fast as the attack kicked in. And the sustain is so short here that it's almost non-existent. Then the release takes over and chokes off the note right away. So the whole envelope of the snare drum is fast and sharp. No sound, loud sound, no sound. And it sounds like that. Now if we compare that to the envelope of the cello, we see the exact opposite. It has this very long drawn out attack where the volume gradually increases. Um, and then there's really no decay at all because the attack just sort of bleeds into the sustain. And the sustain lasts for really as long as the cellist can bow the note. And then the release, just like the attack, is long and drawn out and very gradual. And finally we have our cymbal crash, which is kind of a mixture of the first two envelopes. So we have the attack here that comes on pretty quickly and goes from no volume to loud volume in a short period of time. And then the decay drops the volume back down uh, almost as fast as the attack came on. The sustain lasts for a little while and then the release takes over and the release is very long on the cymbal crash. Um, so long that right about here we can't even see the waveform anymore but we can still hear it. Okay, now that we've compared apples to oranges, let's compare apples to apples. Let's look at the same riff on the same instrument with two different envelopes. So when we compare these two envelopes, we can see that the slap style has a much sharper attack, a more dramatic decay, and a shorter sustain, but the release is pretty similar for both of them. So this is just one example of how we can alter the envelope just a little bit and get a pretty noticeably different sound overall. All right, harmonic content. So first let's just think about those words, harmonic content. So imagine that you're at the grocery store and you go down the juice aisle and you're standing there and in front of you, you've got your orange juice, your apple juice, your cranberry juice, whatever. 
all of the packages say juice on the outside. But what makes them really different from one another? Well, it's the juice inside, right? Orange juice comes from an orange, apple juice comes from an apple. So it's the juice content in the package that makes them each different from one another. Just like it's the harmonic content that makes an A note on a piano sound different than an A note on a guitar. Okay, so then what is harmonic content? Well, we can think about that like a bunch of different frequencies all stuffed into one package and served to you at the same time. And what makes each package different are, first of all, which frequencies are in the package, and second of all, how loud each of those frequencies are when the package is served to you. So here are a couple of examples to help explain this. When we talk about the harmonic content of a sound produced by a musical instrument, there are really two parts to it. There's the fundamental and the overtones. The fundamental is the loudest frequency that we hear, and its job is to tell us which note is being played. So for example, this E note, the fundamental is 84.2 hertz, as opposed to this A note, the fundamental is 110 hertz. So that's what the fundamental does for us. It tells us which note is being played. So then what do the overtones do for us? Well, when I play this E note, we're hearing more than just 84.2 hertz. If that's all we heard, then we would hear a sine wave. We would hear this. Because a sine wave is the simplest form of sound there is. The sine wave is the only thing where there's one frequency at one time. So then the overtones are all of the frequencies that we stuff in the package that let us know that this E note is coming from a guitar. So some of the overtones sound like this. So now when I play this E note, see if you can start to pick out those overtones, especially toward the end of the note as it dies out. Okay, so let's take a look at how overtones shape the fundamental frequency and ultimately sculpt the quality of the sound. So let's dive in and I'll show you what I mean. On the left, we have a sine wave and on the right, we have a square wave. So if we look at our sine wave first and zoom in on it, we can see that it's a sine wave. So it's a pure fundamental frequency. That's the only one there is. There are no overtones here. This particular fundamental frequency is at 110 hertz, and it sounds like this. Okay, and then on the right over here, we have a square wave. And if we zoom in on the square wave, it looks like this. So we can see that this waveform has a square shape. And the way that that happens is we add an overtone series to our fundamental frequency, and the overtones start to push out that rounded form into the square form. So the square wave sounds like this. So now let's take a look at how we build a square wave out of a sine wave. So if we go over here to our graph, we have a fundamental frequency here. So this can be any frequency, um, but for our example, let's say that this is our 110 hertz frequency. This is our fundamental all by itself. So now if we add another frequency to it, this one is three times the frequency at one third the amplitude. So we can see in this one wave shape of our fundamental, we have one, two, three waveforms of our first overtone. Um, and the amplitude is at one third of our fundamental. So now when we add these waveforms together, we get something that looks like this. So we're getting a little bit closer, but let's keep going. The next overtone we add is a waveform that's five times the frequency and one fifth the amplitude of our original fundamental tone. So now if we add this new frequency to what we've already got going on, we get something that looks like this. And then again, if we add another frequency that's seven times our fundamental frequency and one seventh the original amplitude, we get a waveform that looks like this. 
So you can see that as we keep going, it gets closer and closer to a square wave and there's a pattern going on here. And if we keep going using odd numbers to increase the frequency and decrease the amplitude, we get to something that looks like this waveform here. And it's pretty close to a square wave, but in this case, we're limited by the range of what we can actually hear. Remember, we can only go up to about 20,000 Hertz. So this shows that limit. But if we continued the pattern to infinity, we would eventually get a perfect square wave. But a square wave is still a pretty simple waveform. I mean, we were able to come up with an easy math equation to help map out its overtone series. But real world instruments have much more complex waveforms, as we can see here. On the top, we have our simple sine wave with no overtone series. In the middle, we have our square wave with its odd numbered harmonic overtone series. And then on the bottom, we have a sound wave produced by a guitar string with a much more complex overtone series. Um, all three of these have the same fundamental frequency. You can see that all of their waves line up with one another, but they all have a different overtone series, which makes them look and sound dramatically different from one another. So that's it for part one. Thanks for sticking around to watch it. I hope you got something out of it. Um, I'd really appreciate any feedback or comments you can give me. I'd love to know how to make this better. And if you have any questions for me, just drop me a line. I'd love to answer them. Um, so stick around for part two where we'll talk about psychoacoustics. So it's all about how our ears and brain perceive and interpret sound. Uh, all right, I'll catch you there.